welcome to another Residual Oil Zone interview. I'm Chad Terry here with David Mobacher. David has been director of the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute, located at the University of Wyoming since 2010. He has worked with enhanced oil recovery processes since 1978 and has 35 years of experience providing petroleum and chemical engineering expertise to industry-leading corporations. Mr. Mulbucker was a senior petroleum engineer for Amco Production Company when he managed initiation of CO2 flooding in the Works 10 Sleep, the first large-scale carbon dioxide CO2 EOR project in Wyoming. He is currently responsible for managing use of EOR for recovery of stranded oil in more than 600 oil fields in Wyoming. Which brings us to our discussion today, EOR and IOR in Wyoming. So you want to give us a brief history to catch us up to date with the, the field there in Wyoming? Sure. Um, the Wyoming industry, the first wells were drilled in the 1800s, uh, similar to Pennsylvania and, and Texas. Um, Rapid development began as early as the early 1900s. Um, a lot of our fields have produced for over 100 years. Typically, production was developed much like it was in other parts of the United States. Um, early production was primary production. Everybody remembers seeing pictures of gushers in wells where the oil was basically flowing to the surface. All you had to do was collect it. Later on, you might pump it. Beginning in the 1920s through the 1970s, there was a rapid expansion of injecting water then to recover more oil. That's called secondary recovery. And then beginning in the 1960s and um, and we had an intensive effort in the 1980s to recover oil using enhanced oil recovery or tertiary recovery. Can you tell us a little bit about the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute? Right, the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute was created by the Wyoming legislature in 2004. And we were created to help industry, to help the operators in Wyoming recover more of the oil that's still stranded in petroleum reservoirs. So primary production, we usually produce about 10 to 15 percent of the oil that's in the ground. That means 85 percent of the oil, the majority of the oil is left, stranded, trapped in the reservoirs. Uh, with secondary recovery, you might recover another 10 to 20 percent. So the most oil that you typically recover then is something like 30 percent of the oil on the ground, leaving 70 percent. So the big target for tertiary or enhanced oil recovery is that 70% of the original oil in place. So we use um, different technologies to evaluate and then to inject uh, different materials like carbon dioxide or surfactants, which are soaps, to recover another increment of that 70% of the oil that's still in the ground. I see. Yeah. Would you like to tell us a little bit about this chart right here? Sure. The Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute has 18 full-time staff. Uh, we're composed of engineers, geologists, geophysicists, chemists. We have a few business people as well who work with us from the university. Uh, we have different um, areas of technical expertise which are illustrated in this org chart. So we have folks who do characterization of reservoirs. Uh, people who develop models and simulate reservoirs. We have folks who look at engineering and optimization. And then we have folks who look at economics. Mm. And uh, we put together what we call interdisciplinary teams. So uh, we put together teams that, are, that include members of our 18 staff, but we leverage our effort by working with uh, Wyoming oil companies who provide their staff as well. So we all work together in a single team. Right, so that's kind of the triad that I had seen. It is. And so, it okay. is. That triad in indicates that the legislature, state government sponsors our work. Uh, the university, we're located at the university and that's where the institute staff sit. And then we work with operators to basically produce more oil and book more oil reserves. Okay, why don't you tell us about the Energy Innovation Center? Right, we just built and moved into a new Energy Innovation Center that's a research facility on the University of Wyoming's campus. Uh, the building 
Uh, it's comprised of approximately 35,000 square feet of space, and it's split evenly between laboratories, offices, and then meeting spaces and classrooms. And the purpose of the building is to do energy research with regard to oil recovery, with regard to production of uh, natural gas, uh, coal, so conversion of coal, as well as renewable resources, evaluation and development of renewable resources like solar and wind. Okay. What can you tell us about the goals for the funds, for the EORI funds? So the, uh, the Institute has several parts to its mission. Um, part of our mission is to benchmark and define best practices. So that means one company can learn from another. So we coordinate those efforts. Uh, second effort is outreach so that we can take what we learn and apply it in the oil field. And there's a progression of things we do from collecting the information, talking to other innovators, and then transferring that technology to Wyoming operators. Uh, we can do it uh, through use of the laboratory, through our training uh, programs. We have a series of workshops and conferences and just by working on teams with oil companies. So uh, once again, our mission is to benchmark best practices, transfer that knowledge to the industry, and then assist them with uh, real world demonstrations. Would you like to tell us about some of the current projects? Sure, um, we're working on a, on a number of projects, typically we're active with 10 to 15 projects with operators at any one time. Uh, we focused our efforts uh, with regard to some of the geologic basins. So we're here in Midland and we're in the Permian Basin. Wyoming's divided into basins as well. And the major basins are the Bighorn Basin, the Powder River Basin, Wind River Basin. So we're working with operators in each of those areas with specific reservoirs. The two most prolific oil producers in Wyoming have been the Thames Leap and the Minnelusa formations. So we have consortiums to work in those with companies who operate in those two areas. So why don't you tell me about some of the factors that are contributing to the current oil boom we're in? Right, it's a combination of development of new technology and higher oil prices. So the new technologies are new drilling and completion techniques, horizontal drilling, improved hydraulic fracturing, coupled with improved characterization techniques using uh, 3D seismic, 4D seismic. So that's brought the cost of uh, development down and also provided new opportunities to develop petroleum that we didn't think were, well, they weren't commercially developable even 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, the higher oil price is driven by the world market. And so because of the higher oil price, oil companies can afford to spend more money learning about how to, how to right. develop new plays like the Eagleford or the Bakken. And it also applies to enhanced and improved oil recovery. We can also afford to do more things and still be able to make money while right. we develop the technology. So technology, higher oil price. So are ROZs part of this new technologies and developments? They are. Uh, residual oil zones uh, have been commercially developed in the Permian Basin. And I think there are up to 13 new projects that are being produced from what we call residual oil zones. And I'll come back to what residual oil zones are in a minute. Uh, Wyoming also has residual oil zones, so we're trying to learn from what's been done in the Permian, in, in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico in the Permian Basin, we're trying to learn how we can apply those same concepts in Wyoming. So we know we have large residual oil zones or ROZs. The question is, how do, what resources do we need to develop them and how do we prove that they can be developed? So let's go back to what an ROZ is. Basically a residual oil zone exists beneath what we have traditionally produced. And uh, a common term for the reservoirs that we've traditionally produced are main pay zones. Right. Um, underneath those main pay zones and out on the flanks of the reservoir, there's still oil. It just wasn't commercially, you couldn't commercially produce it 
using primary or secondary techniques. Mm -hmm. Now that we have tertiary techniques, primarily carbon dioxide injection, we can now go into those large areas underneath those old main pay zones and there's another whole amount of oil that can be produced and they're large amounts of oil, billions of barrels of oil uh, that we can access. So um, the industry is using new technical developments to characterize and produce those residual oil zones. I see. Yeah. So a big question that anyone would ask that wants to know about CO2 flooding is, where does all the CO2 come from? So carbon dioxide, what is carbon dioxide? I always think of it as the bubbles that are in my Coke when I drink it. That's carbon dioxide, the fizz. Um, carbon dioxide is generated when we breathe. So we inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Uh, there are natural sources of carbon dioxide and there are man-made or anthropogenic sources of carbon dioxide. Uh, we use, in, in the oil industry, we use both natural sources and man-made sources of carbon dioxide. Uh, in Wyoming, um, all of our carbon dioxide currently comes from natural gas production. So we'll produce methane and other byproducts of methane Carbon dioxide is one of those byproducts. Okay. So almost all of Wyoming's carbon dioxide has come from the Bar La Barge platform, which is located in the southwest part of the state. And Exxon's operated a gas plant called Sheep Creek um, near La Barge um, since 1986. And they've provided almost all of the carbon dioxide the industry has used for the last 30 years. Um, now, more recently, new sources are being developed. There's another gas plant called Lost Cabin that's kind of in the north central portion of the state where we're capturing carbon dioxide to uh, implement EOR projects as okay. well. In the future, there could be many new sources of carbon dioxide in Wyoming. Um, the coal industry is evaluating converting coal to gasoline or diesel or other products, and a, a byproduct of that process will be carbon dioxide. What is the current situation concerning CO2 in Wyoming? Uh, the current situation, we just, uh, Denbury is one of the operators in Wyoming, just initiated a new project at Grieve. So with the addition of Grieve, we now have nine CO2 enhanced oil recovery projects in the state. Uh, the Institute is aware of an, an equal number of projects that are waiting on CO2. So once we have carbon dioxide, uh, we can move forward and probably de and definitely have the potential to double the amount of activity in the state. The projects are there. Now it's a matter of delivering, collecting and delivering the carbon dioxide. Um, we've talked about the potential sources. Uh, the infrastructure needed to take the CO2 from the source to where it's going to be used is also being expanded. Mm. So this slide demonstrates the pipeline system and it shows the two sources of carbon dioxide at Chute Creek in the southwest part of the state up to Lost Cabin in the central part of the state. The laterals have been built to Monell, Beaver Creek, and Salt Creek where Anadarko is operating. So our pipeline system continues to expand. Um, we're very hopeful that we'll be able to uh, attract someone to build a pipeline from southwest Wyoming, where the Labarge platform is, up into the Bighorn Basin. What does it take to make a profitable barrel of oil from CO2 flooding? So basically, producing oil from carbon dioxide is much less expensive than producing oil from unconventional reservoirs that everybody's reading about today. Okay. The Eagleford, the Bakken, the Sprayberry are all unconventional plays, and uh, the cost of production I've seen for those plays, uh, Denbury published some data about a year ago uh, for their Bakken, they actually were doing Bakken work at the time. Oh, okay. So the cost of producing a barrel of oil in the Bakken was on the order of $70 to $80 a barrel.
current world oil price is around 100. Mm -hmm. They also estimated the cost of producing an incremental barrel of oil from carbon dioxide. That equivalent cost was in the 40 to 50 dollar range. So it's less expensive to produce oil from in CO2 EOR than it is from unconventional projects. But there's, there's a reason that people continue to invest a lot of money in unconventionals. And the reason is, is the lead time to implement a CO2 project is long. Mm. So it may take uh, three to five years to capture, build the equipment to capture the carbon dioxide, the pipeline to distribute it, and the field investment to inject it and produce it. So you want to discuss some of the, the impacts that the CO2 EOR is uh, having on the state of Wyoming? Absolutely, and, and actually we have a slide to illustrate that. Mm -hmm. uh, the slide I'm looking at uh, shows the amount of oil produced over time, starting in the late 80s through current time. And it also shows the oil price. So. Um, Oil revenues have increased with time because of increased oil price, as have the taxes that are, that are paid to counties and states, which average around 11.5%, 12%. So if you look at those total amount of taxes paid over time, uh, that's a huge part of the state's income. Right. Um, the importance of longer term enhanced oil recovery projects also is it creates jobs. And uh, um, our economists have looked at impacts of future development uh, and have published papers. And what they illustrate is that growth of CO2 EOR could create um, ten, tens of thousands of jobs, mm -hmm. especially in the Bighorn Basin, over the next 30 to 40 years. With all of that information being gone through, I mean, this has a tremendous effect on all sorts of levels of uh, government and the community. It does, Chad. Um, enhanced oil recovery and carbon dioxide enhanced oil recovery in particular um, has a lot of positive influences for um, our communities, our state, as well as our country. Um, Enhanced oil recovery gives us the ability to get more resources out of fields that have already been developed. So there are few um, additional negative impacts associated with continuing to operate these fields that we've been operating for decades and in some cases a hundred years. Mm -hmm. Two, it allows us to produce more oil and be more energy independent in the United States over the long term. And uh, three, it creates jobs and generates important revenue for states and counties in the state of Wyoming. Mm. So it allows, um, it allows Wyoming people, students, to work in Wyoming and do so for a long time. So, That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for coming and sharing your insights into the Wyoming fields. And thank you for watching Residual Zone interviews. If you take a look down in the description, you'll see links to all the resources discussed today. And don't forget to like this video and share it so that we can keep on making Residual Zone interviews. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.